Welcome to the service on behalf of Claremont Parish Church. Things are changing all the time and uh, many other parts of the service today will be woven in from elsewhere. And we meet not together, we meet in different places and probably watching this too at different times. But we gather together as the people of God and we gather into the presence of a God who longs to be with us, longs to gather us. Jesus said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. We come to a God who is willing, and so let us give that God praise as we sing the hymn, O for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. we pray, I I should have said at the beginning that uh, a couple of weeks ago we had hoped that we would be introducing uh, Miriam Murphy um, at the morning service. Miriam has joined us here at Claremont, just joined us just pretty much as everything's been shutting down. But Miriam's going to be working as children, young person and families worker 
And Marian is taking part in the service today in the reading and in the prayers for others. But firstly, our prayer as we approach God together, a prayer of confession, and we'll gather up our prayers in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Lord, how heartening it is, how good it is for us to know that you're a God who would gather up your people. How good it is for us to know that you're a God who in Jesus came right into the midst of the, the hurting, the sore, the disputed, the unclean. He didn't keep in a place of safety and shouted at us from a distance. But uh, you, Jesus, you showed yourself to be the God who embraces us even in our soreness, even in our hearts even in our uncleanness. In particular, you came in Jesus to deal with sin, not sins that you had done, but our sin. And in Jesus, you took upon yourself the burden of that sin, bearing the wrath and bearing the punishment that we deserved, so that through Christ's death and indeed through his resurrection, we might be counted able and worthy to be in your holy presence. And so we come to a God eager to gather us up. We come to a God who has provided a way of salvation. And so we come as sinners seeking forgiveness. We come as disciples seeking to better learn. We come as ambassadors seeking to be helped, to be better representatives and witnesses. We come as the body of Christ, even though we have been separated and today meet in different rooms and meet at different times as well. Unite us through your Holy Spirit. Assure us now of the peace and pardon of sins forgiven. And help us indeed to be better disciples, better witnesses, better ambassadors for our Lord Jesus, in whose name we pray, and in whose words we gather up our prayers. Our Father in heaven. Gospel according to Mark, Mark chapter 5, verses 21 to 43. Jesus raises a dead girl and heals a sick woman. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him. My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. <gasps> because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped. And she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had come out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? You see?
see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered. And yet you can ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, Don't be afraid. Just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw com a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the girl stood up. Began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Well, you can imagine as Jesus stepped into those uh, situations, as Jesus you know, spoke to that woman and brought her out in front of the crowd, as Jesus um, visited Jairus' house with his recently deceased daughter lying there. There'd be lots of a whole range of emotions and feelings going on at the time, but not least there would be fear about what's happening and why it's happening. That has often been the position that the people of God have found themselves in. And at times like this, we should hear again the words of God, and this time the hymn based on words through the prophet Isaiah. Do not be afraid. We'll sing together.
Well, again, between Sundays, the situation has changed. A couple of weeks ago, we were raising eyebrows at the thought that we might meet but not have tea and coffee afterwards. Last week, we gathered a few of us here and put together the, as near as we could the, the service. And even between last week and this, there's been changes and other parts of the service have been recorded elsewhere at other times and, and inserted but we still aim, and we cannot guarantee it's going to be this format every week, we still aim to be putting out something as close to what a morning service at Claremont looks like. Again, like last week, the prevalence of the coronavirus crisis that we're in is such that I'm leaving aside our Lent series on Isaiah 53. And this week I'm turning to a passage in Mark chapter 5, passage that Miriam brought to us in the reading. The first impetus to look at that passage today came as I was reading in an app on my phone, Lectio 365. Lectio is L-E-C-T-I-O, 365. It's a daily reading, one for each day of the year, uh, reading and a reflection, and organized by Pete Gregg, and um, I cannot really overstate how good it is and if you're someone who has access to um, apps on whatever gadgets you're using, I very much recommend Lectio 365 as something to cons- look at each day. It's only for a few minutes, but the reflections are very moving, very powerful, and very helpful in our walk with God. This passage in Mark weaves together two stories, uh, weaves together two healings. The woman who has um, had some bleeding, and Jairus' daughter. Both of these stories feature Jesus touching someone else. In our keep two, minute, two meters distance from one another, in our time of elbow bumping and not handshaking and so on, we're beginning to see more and more that touch has actually been very, something that's very important to us. Folks have been dying alone in hospital, not being able to be visited and touched by members of their family, and that's been sore for them and sore for the members of the family. And just a week before last, our younger daughter was up for a few days. Um, Sally lives in London, the kind of coronavirus capital of the UK at the moment, and because she was up, I was forbidden to do any hugging over the few days she was here. We, we had a great time. There was lots of things enjoyable about it, but boy, I really missed not being able to hug her. Touch matters. And as we were saying last week, one of the big lessons of the virus is that we are not anything like as independent, not anything like as self-sufficient as we thought we were. In our weakness, in our fragility, in our need for companionship, in our longing for touch, we have a God who offers Himself to us. And that's one of the things that we see in this passage in Mark chapter 5. We see Jesus has got a personal touch. He's asked by Jairus to go with him and to see if he could heal his 12-year-old daughter who was very unwell. And as Jesus made his way through the crowd with all the bustling and jostling going on, he knew that someone had touched him and touched him quite specifically and quite deliberately. He stops the whole thing. Who, who was it that touched me, he says. The disciples think that's a daft thing to ask. There's so much bumping, there's so much jostling. Well, loads of folks had touched them. But Jesus was aware of that more significant touch, the deliberate touch. The woman who had been bleeding, had bleeds for 12 years, had tried to remain anonymous. The Jewish purity laws meant that on top of her pain and discomfort, she was regarded as unclean. She was cut off from the community, unable to attend worship, not welcome to be with other people. And so there was a spiritual and an emotional death on top of her physical condition. And it was due to her being cut off, it was due to that excommunication from the Jewish people that she had tried to remain anonymous, desperate to get close enough to touch Jesus' garments. And then she'd hoped, after she had done that, verse 28, that she could slip away. 
But Jesus called her out into the open. She had wanted to stop bleeding. Jesus wanted her to start living. Jesus is concerned for the whole person. The woman needed to know that it was Jesus, not his garments, who heals. She needed to know that Jesus was more than someone who sorts out her problems for us. She needed to know that here was someone who was concerned about her, who loved her, who was a savior for her. And then later in the story, when Jesus gets to Jairus' house and he's told this time that the daughter, by this time that the daughter had died, once more as he, after he had raised her from the dead, he took, took her by the hand, verse 41. He touched her. Now, we know that Jesus didn't always have to touch people in order to heal them. In fact, Jesus didn't even have to be in the, in the vicinity. In John chapter 4, for example, we have the story of the centurion's servant being healed and being healed back at home while the centurion was miles away with Jesus. But Jesus, you see, is not just doing something to please folk. And he's certainly not trying to impress people. He'd sent most of them out of the house before he raised Jairus' daughter. See verse 40. No, here is God coming to us particularly. Here is God coming to us individually. Here is a God who cares, who wants wholeness for us, who has compassion, a God who touches us where we are. And even after the, the girl is raised, Jesus doesn't say to Jairus, go and show her off, and especially show her off to the people who were laughing at me five minutes ago. No, what does he say? Verse 43, go and get her something to eat. It's time for her dinner. He was just concerned about the personal details. Jesus has a personal touch. And secondly, that personal touch means that Jesus is willing to touch the impure. Now, in Jesus' time, there were strict rules about not touching people or things that were considered unclean. And menstruating women and dead people were part of the group who were not to be touched. Maybe at some point we've looked at some of these Old Testament laws and thought, that's a bit over the top, isn't it? But maybe in this day of not shaking hands, of washing hands everywhere we go and so on, maybe we need to reevaluate some of our decisions about these rules given in Leviticus and elsewhere. Jesus had made it plain when he was baptized by John the Baptist, and the story's back in Mark chapter 1. Jesus had made it plain then that he was identifying with sinners. He had nothing to repent of himself. He was standing alongside us. He is one who comes among us, becomes vulnerable, one who takes risks, one who does what the holier-than-thou brigade think is scandalous. And through that sharing, he brings light into our darkness, brings hope into despair, brings change and transformation. And it reaches right into the worst, into the most impure, into the don't go there places. There is no one who is beyond the reach of God. There is no one who has put themselves so far into uncleanness, so far into sin, so far into disobedience that the grace of God is not sufficient to reach in and touch them where they are. Now, it's one of the constant challenges then for Jesus' followers. One of the constant challenges for the church is how we do that, be both distinctive about following Jesus, but also engaged with the world around us. We see Jesus doing this. Jesus, there is no doubt here. There is no compromise. He is the Son. He is of God. He is the Savior. And yet here he is being very involved with the ordinary, the unclean, and so on. And down through the years of the history of the church, so often on the one hand that we make the error of trying to keep ourselves pure by withdrawing from the world, by not engaging in the parts of the world that seem unseemly or dirty. But Jesus didn't do that. He touched the impure. He welcomed sinners. He let disgraced people give him hospitality and minister to him. On the other hand, there is the danger of the church getting involved in the world, but as she does so, she loses her Christian distinctiveness. 
in our concern to be with and to be alongside others, we forget that we have to represent Jesus and that compromise is not a Christian virtue. Now, there's no correct formula for this. There is no 50-50 balance that's always right in every situation. But it's something that the people of God have to seek to maintain, being both in but not of the world, being salt and light, being engaged, but at the same time being distinctive. It's a missionary calling, and it's a missionary calling that's not fulfilled by, by us taking sides in society, by our becoming bedfellows with some people and not the others. The church's identification with, with some, sometimes with middle-class values, has meant that we've left others out. At worst times in our history, it's been identifying with, say, white people and excluding blacks and, or whatever. But it's only as in the phrase of the Apostle Paul that we learn to become all things to all people. Only in that can we be faithful. Jesus here is giving us an example to follow. Be involved. Be engaged. Don't hold back. Be with even the unpleasant and the the impure. But do that in such a way that we still remain committed to our Jesus lifestyle, our Christian distinctives. So, Jesus had a personal touch. It was a personal touch that reached out to the impure, but also it was a touch that healed people. Except that Jesus draws attention to the fact that it's faith that heals. The woman in verses 25 to 34, the woman with the blades, needed to know that it was not the touching but the trusting that brought her healing. And so Jesus says, verse 34, your faith has healed you. You see, Jesus wanted a deeper relationship. He wanted it with her. He wants it with us. He's not simply to be some power that we can call on when we think we need something done. Jesus was not a magician doing tricks by some secret power for an amazed but uninvolved audience. He is God come to us, God among us, God touching earth with heaven. He's come to bring God and sinners together to heal our every brokenness and bring us into fellowship with the living God. And so, instead of some mysterious power doing something to help this woman, what was going on, rather, is that she was being embraced in the arms of God. She was receiving God's salvation. God's love was being given to her. It was her faith that would enable her to receive from the Lord. Now, it was one thing for Jesus to be helping this woman to faith, It was one thing for Jesus to not just let her slip off anonymously into the distance, thinking that some magic had been done. But I wonder what was going on in Jairus' mind at this point. He had asked Jesus to go with him to his house. His daughter was critically ill. Jesus agreed, and so they they, they set off. But then Jesus stops. Then Jesus not simply has this woman made better, but he calls her out and has a conversation with her. And all the time, poor Jairus must be thinking, yeah, but my daughter's really ill. My daughter is dangerously unwell. Jesus, this isn't a time for a wee chat. This is a time, get the blue lights going, get the sirens on. We need to hurry. And it must have been a real test of of Jairus' faith that Jesus wasn't rushing the way he would have wanted to. And then his faith was tested further when, verse 35, came the word that this daughter had died. And now it seems too late. But yet Jesus is still going down the road with Jairus. Maybe it would have been better, Jairus is thinking, if Jesus hadn't blethered for so long. Why bother the teacher anymore, said his his friends. It's not worth it. And I can imagine Jairus walking down the road with Jesus and his friends saying, is is he still coming? And Jairus saying, yeah, he's still coming. And why does does he do a good eulogy at the funeral? Is that why he's coming? 
Um, no, I think he thinks he can make it better, says Jairus. All the time, you see, his faith being put to the test. And if that faith was not being put to the test, Jairus might not have realized it was there. Jesus was more than a teacher, more than a miracle worker. And just as the woman had to step out of the crowd and identify herself, so Jairus had to show trust and loyalty to Jesus as they were walking back to the house. And then he had to show more trust and more loyalty to Jesus as Jesus invites scorn by saying, oh, the girl's not dead, she's just sleeping. And as the people laugh at Jesus, Jairus is still saying, well, I'm taking him up to the bedroom anyway. And then Jesus asks for the other folks to be sent out of the house, to be put outside. And Jairus has to do that. And now the people are probably laughing at him as well as laughing at Jesus. Jairus' faith makes his daughter well. The kingdom of God, these are signs, these healings of the kingdom of God being on its way. It's a sign that God's kingdom is something that we can reach out and touch or be touched by. But why, if Jesus can do this, why are there not more than three instances in the New Testament of Jesus raising someone from the dead? The others are in Luke chapter 7 and in John chapter 11. Why not more? We think by this time in the story, Jesus father, Joseph, has already died. Could Jesus not have raised him? Could Jesus not have stopped that happening? Well, just as Jesus did not come into this world to be a one-man liberation movement, leading a revolution against Rome and setting up a new national and political kingdom for Israel, neither did he come into this world to be a one-man emergency service. Yes, he was bringing God's healing power, but his aim went deeper. Illness and death being overcome were but signs of the real revolution, the real healing that God was to accomplish through Jesus' death and resurrection. Jesus is ushering his people into a new promised land, this time a land that is entered not by crossing a river, but through faith. He is enter inviting his people to follow him into a salvation that will be complete but only for those who accept the first tastes, the first fruits that receive Jesus through faith. Like the woman and like Jairus and Mark 5, we have to let Jesus do his work in us. Only if we see and receive Jesus' work in all its dimensions will we understand that behind the intense and intimate dramas of each story, there lies a larger and darker theme to which Mark is drawing our attention. A conflict that's only going to be settled through the death and resurrection of Jesus. Jesus is on his way to meet with death and evil. The things that threaten God's wonderful creation. He is on his way not just to meet them, but to defeat them. And defeat them in a way that was as unexpected as these two healings in Mark 5. And as he does so, he is living out God's love for us. He is living out the touch of God. He is living out the care for the impure. He is bringing to light the tenderness of God in caring about us and caring for us. That doesn't mean that all of our immediate needs are necessarily met. It doesn't mean that God is going to sort things out for us according to how we see things. But it means that by establishing the basis, the ground for his kingdom to come, his work to be done on earth as it is in heaven, he's giving sign of what that kingdom will bring. Mostly that kingdom brings love. Love which issues in our salvation. A love that cares and acts and transforms. A love that is now realized and tasted and experienced through faith. And so in this time of face masks, elbow bumps, foot taps, two meter distance between people, Jesus still wants to come to us, to meet us face to face and to touch our lives. 
And even when life crowds around us with all its pressures, just as people were crowding in around this woman and people crowding in around Jairus' house, even when things are piling in and getting on top of us, there is still room for us to creep or crawl to Jesus if that is all that we feel we can do. There is still opportunity now to reach out and touch Him in that odd mixture of fear and faith that characterizes so much of the people of the New Testament and so much of Christian discipleship today. And the good news is that Jesus is ready to receive. Jesus didn't scold the woman for not standing, not coming to Him openly. He didn't give Jairus a hard time as he waited and fretted. No, Jesus is ready to receive, ready to give, wanting our healing and wanting our faith to grow so that our entry into His kingdom is all the more full. He wants us to be sure of His love and sure of His welcome. And that knowing that we are loved and being sure of His welcome is something that we only discover when we trust. Trust even when things are looking bleak, even when we've tried and tried and tried again as the woman in the story had over the 12 years of her illness, she had tried everything to get better. But, verse 26, she just grew worse. Even when things get like that, even when things look like they've gone all pear-shaped, even when it looks like it did for Jairus' daughter as though it's been a missed opportunity, a, a too late. In the economy of the kingdom of God, it is not too late. It is never too late for us to show faith and trust. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the way that you come time and again into people's lives the way that you touched and changed lives there back in the New Testament and the way that you've been touching and changing lives of your people ever since. We give thanks for the way that you still touch and change and transform lives even today. Might that give us confidence to come to you, confidence to be open with you, Might we realize and recognize, as the woman found out in the story, that we can't hide things from you? Might we learn, as Jairus had to do, to to wait upon you and wait for you? And Lord, might we find in these times our trust growing, our faith blossoming. Lord, not just for our sake, but for your glory. Amen. If things are always um, fine and going to be finer, then there is no need for hope. But we live in a very mixed and a very hurting world. And one of the things that the gospel does offer is hope. And we sing of that in our next hymn, There is a Hope. And after we've sung the hymn together, we'll confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. The words for the hymn and for the Creed will both be on our screens. And after we've confessed our faith in the Apostles' Creed, uh, Miriam's going to lead us in prayer.
I believe. Let us pray for our communities, for our church, and for each other. Father, at this time of turmoil and uncertainty, we look outside of ourselves to others, others who perhaps do not know you as their source of strength and comfort as we do. Father, be merciful to us, to our families, to our neighbours, and to our country. We bring to you in prayer the decision makers of this country at this time of extraordinary challenges in business and in politics. Be close to those who are needing to make decisions, who represent us in our governments and give them wisdom. Help them to turn to you and let them be guided by you in your mercy. Let them know you are near to all who call upon you and seek your face, no matter what their past or their former commitment to you has been. We also pray for the figureheads of this country, Prince Charles and the royal family. Stir them to look to you and find peace and comfort in you and acknowledge you as the source of all life and flourishing. Father, bind us together at this time and unite us in purpose and love that we may stand as a church of believers and as a wider circle of Christians in prayer and intercession for our country and for our local areas. Help us to be your witness at this difficult time and bring glory to your name by our actions and speech. Open our eyes to opportunities for being good neighbours and loving and faithful family members. Help us to make best out of the situation and spend quality time with those with whom we are sharing our homes. Lord, in particular, be with those who are alone. As a church, Help us together to break the isolation of those confined in their homes alone. Help us to bring them joy by being there for them in whatever way we are able. Father, we seek to trust you that no circumstance is out of your control and no circumstance beyond your redeeming power and intention. That in all things you are triumphant and your kingdom victorious. And we too are triumphant in you as your word says. So we lift our eyes to the hills where our help comes from, to you, to our stronghold and to our protector. And we know that even though we are now restricted to go and see others, family and friends, you will be able to reach them in whatever circumstances they are in. Lord, each one of us have people in our hearts we are concerned about, some with underlying health conditions, some who are alone and without company, some who suffer from anxiety more than others. We are now bringing these people to you in prayer and ask you to help and comfort them, to be stronghold to them, to reveal yourself and your love to them through us or through others or through circumstances around them. We take a moment to name these people in our hearts. Our hearts also go out to those who due to this situation suffer financially, feel insecure as how they will make their living and how they are to feed themselves and their families and pay the bills. Father, open up avenues of income and financial provision for those whose everyday life has been thrown into jeopardy and help us as a church and as individuals be mindful of this kind of suffering that has come to many through this situation. Help us to see the need 
and respond to it when we see it around us. Father, in all this, we give you praise as we know you're the same God throughout the ages, yesterday, today and tomorrow, dependable and faithful. You have written in your word that we are to rejoice in all circumstances. So even in this, we lift our hearts to you in thankfulness and rejoicing, rejoicing in your faithfulness and in your goodness to us and to all life on this planet. Amen. Well, just before we come to our closing prayer, just a reminder that um, we're pretty much shut shop, nothing on during the week except that we, we will be sending out whatever messages we can on, on email and the like, and we do encourage you to, to share these as best you can, especially with those who are not got access to the internet. Also, to say that this week we've incorporated a, a leaflet about prayer that is on the screen. Um, usually, when we gather on a Sunday morning, we've made the offer, if anyone wants prayer, there's people after the service here to, to do that with you. Um, so as an alternative to that, um, here is the opportunity to send us prayer requests, and those who are on the prayer rota, who are on that prayer team, will be more than pleased to share in that ministry by praying for us. Not this coming week, but the following week is, is Holy Week, and from Monday to Friday, we will be having our Holy Week services, but of course, not having them here at Claremont, we were putting together services, and they will appear on the website through that week, um, 7 o'clock, from Monday the 6th through to Friday the 10th of April. Just before I came out today, I had uh, noticed that um, the death of one of our members at Claremont, of Jean Anderson, um, Jean of Glen Bervey, um, <clears throat> and do ask you to remember Jean's family and your prayers. And then we conclude our service by singing, Bless the Lord, O My Soul, and after we've sung that hymn together, we'll finish with the, the words of the grace, which, like again, will be on the, the words will be on the screen. Mm -hmm.